So my talk this evening is really a rather broad brush and selective overview of some aspects of what I'm increasingly coming to realize is a very big subject and one in which I'm on a steep learning curve and uh, where I think there is certainly scope and indeed need for much more research. Um, the theme of, uh, of taking the idea of archaeological illustration for the anniversary book that came, as, as, as I already said, because I'm actually curating and cataloguing the large number of these ArchCam blocks, which somehow or other came into our joint uh, possession and uh, has been part of uh, my life for the last 20 years, but I really hope it's not going to be part of my life for the next decade. They need, they need a better home. Um, and again, uh, I really was only able to get on with this work once acquired um, from our member, Anne Sayer, a full set of arch cams because that has helped check on the work. Well, thanks, Sean. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to say that uh, it's been a pleasure to work with uh, you, Toby, on the project. And, I, I, and indeed, it wouldn't have been possible to achieve without, without your input. So many thanks. Oh, it's a good... Uh, right one. Right one? Nope. Oh, hell. Um, <laughs> that's been recorded. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. So it's, it is yeah, a person. It's, 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 it's the left one. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, just by, by way of background, before we get on to some of the engravers and illustrators, um, and as Nancy said this morning, from the early 19th century onwards, and particularly from the 1840s, there was a huge increase in the printed word, newspaper, books, magazines, journals, and with that, of course, expanding literacy right across Victorian society. And undoubtedly this facilitated what was already a burgeoning interest in the past, the nation's past, that led to the foundation of many archeological and historical societies such as ours in 1846. And as we've heard, hard on the heels of the foundation of the British Archaeological Association in 1843. Now published in 1683, Moxon's Mechanic Exercises and the book has been out on display for you to have a look at, describe printing presses and processes which had been familiar to Gutenberg. And yet this work remained an authoritative handbook going through many editions right into the early 19th century. Now, a key invention in the second half of the 18th century was the production of iron presses, notably that designed and built by Earl Stanhope. And this could cope with faster and more repeated use of printing forms of type than its wooden precursors. But the real revolution, however, was the application of steam power to printing presses. Um, and this came relatively late, really, in the application of steam power to all manner of machines and is generally attributed to the German inventors Koenig and Bauer in, in the second decade of the 19th century rapidly taken up across Europe and America, um, especially by newspapers such as the Times. Now, the second important driver, as it were, of this continued industrialization of printing processes were two major inventions in paper production. Textile production, as we know, was revolutionized by the inventions of the later 18th century. But even in the early 19th century, uh, paper was still being made by laborious hand processes from rags and linen. And the key invention here, and mechanizing this process, had been made in France, but it was the alliance of the entrepreneur John Gamble with two immigrant Huguenot brothers, Seeley and Henry Foudrinier in London, to patent a machine in 1801. And only with its refinement, by that versatile and unsung hero, really, an inventor, Brian Dworkin, in 1807, that these machines, known as Foudriniers throughout the century, came into production. And the next big breakthrough really comes in the 1850s, uh, first developed in America 
uh, when wood pulp was used to produce paper, replacing the more costly rag, linen and cotton waste materials. And this is marked in Britain by the foundation in 1850 of the firm Wiggins Tea, still going, but I don't think they're dealing with paper these days. The printing presses of the 1840s and 1850s could take bigger beds of type and sheets of paper. And as we see in journals like Archcam, and in this example I have, you see with this eight page imposition, uh, printing first on one side of the paper, carefully numbering the pages, and then reversing uh, uh, running the uh, press across the second, the other side of the paper, uh, you could produce um, something which could be folded uh, by hand into sections and then sewn together. And from the beginning and indeed into the 20th century, uh, Archcam was delivered to members in four successive parts through the years, often with papers serialized. And finally, before moving on to look at some of the early artists and engravers, we need to consider the revolutions in communication and thus distribution of the greatly expanding volume of printed material of all kinds, the expanding network of railways, better road transport, and crucially, the standardization and remarkably economic and ever more frequent postal services following on Roland Hill's ideas that were adopted by the government. Uh, in an act of parliament after his proposals in 1839. Things moved rapidly. Um, entrepreneurs like WH uh, Smith realized that uh, you know, a lot of this new printed material could be sold at railway stations, bookstores. First bookstore, I think, in London, Houston, 1882, I think. Um, and although WH <laughs> Smith uh, insisted on a fairly high-minded and respectable content for books and magazines and newspapers on his news stores. He was satirised in Dickens as old morality. And I think the firm actually, if I remember, it might use satirised by private eye as um, WH Smug. Because <laughs> 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 at that stage it wouldn't uh, stop private eye. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, this expanded the reading material available uh, to the travelling public. Now, I'm not suggesting in any way that um, uh, fascicules of Arch Cam were on these railway bookstores, but you know there was a, a big range of, uh, in many ways, quite high-minded, uh, high-minded material. And the final thing really is that uh, you know we think nothing of uh, when you're travelling, you know, plane or, or, or train, sitting and reading, but this was quite a new thing to do, very sociably acceptable. Uh, certainly not something that you do comfortably if you are traveling um, by mail coach. So these three things, I think, absolutely revolutionary, really, through the 1840s. Now, publishers would uh, bind up a year's issue with a paper cover, as you see on the left there. Um, and... Uh, the book binders, or if the publishers were big enough, they had their own bindery sections, would bind in the sheets with steel engravings and other plates. Um, and you'll notice on the bottom left on this slide, uh, one or two of the early arch cams have these directions to the binder, where to place these illustrations. Uh, and what I've discovered as I'm going through is, um, they didn't always get it right, and they're not always there, uh, which is ever more reason, I think, for libraries uh, not to kind of think that they need to discard their shelf runs of uh, full sets of volumes, because I wonder, and I mean, who on earth could undertake this research? It'd be very difficult. Uh, certainly in the set I've got, there are, there are years where there are missing illustrations. Um, and it could be that there is no one set in, in our libraries that actually has all the illustrations. Mm -hmm. So this rather horrendous practice of uh, you know, reducing the number of printed copies of journal runs because, oh, they've been digitized and they're online, um, carries certain dangers, yeah. certain dangers with it. And the other thing, of course, we get in the in the 19th century from the 18th, well, from the 1830s really onwards, is 
is innovations in bookbinding itself. The use of inexpensive card covers, as you see up there with the, and that's the British Archaeological Association Journal. And then later in the century for popular books, these remarkable two and three color covers. In fact, that book on the right there, one of my most treasured possessions, um, and massively useful, in fact, in preparing this talk, Discoveries and Inventions of the 19th Century by Robert Routledge. I have the sixth edition published in 1884. But most of the sets of Archcam that we now have, or perhaps in our possession, uh, come from libraries or in, are in libraries. And well-off Cambrians would have their issues leather bound and, and uh, marbled end papers and placed on their, on their library shelves. Now, the turn to the illustrations themselves um, and the techniques used. Well, we heard from Nancy a bit this morning about, about wood engravers, so I won't replicate, uh, re replicate that. In, in the pages of Archcam, these are always called cuts, uh, wood cuts. Um, there were, of course, other methods of illustrating printing illustrations, notably lithographs in the large and expensive volumes that graced the libraries of the upper classes. But the woodcut had one overriding advantage. The wood block could be set into the page of type, into a form of type uh, and printed together with the printed word. Whereas the other illustrations that we've talked about, steel engravings and so on, these had to be uh, separately printed and tipped in, as they said in the trade, at the bookbinding stage, a much more expensive and, and labor intensive process. And by the 1840s, there were several hundred wood engravers working in London alone. The equipment was affordable, graving tools, a leather pad or cushion, uh, a good oil lamp. Engravers, as Nancy said this morning, often worked into long hours into the night to get their cut to the printers on time. Simple tools, gravers or burins, tint tools, uh, and the other two, um, scorpers and spit stickers. <laughs> um, and generally these are used at an angle and the variations in the angle and the skill in the graving depth uh, marks out the, 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 the master practitioners from those uh, less ex experienced. And the wood used by preference is box, fine grain box, um, English box preferred, but this was very scarce. And in the early mid 19th century, um, 1840s and so, this was sourced from the Caucasus, uh, but supplies of large, large timber began to get exhausted. Moving on then to sources from Venezuela, South Africa, and so on. And of course, but even there, most box trees are small, blocks were cut horizontally and squared up. So they're quite small. So it was common practice to skillfully join smaller pieces together. And you'll see that in a number of the examples uh, in, the, in the exhibition, um, tonguing and gluing, and later in the 19th century, screwing together, some very clever uh, devices used there. And if kept too dry, of course, blocks can, can split apart. So what happened was that sometimes after the drawing or later on the photograph had been traced onto the block, uh, they might have been split up again and different engravers did some of the basic work Then they were rejoined and the master engraver would, would do the, the, the final touches. Um, and one interesting uh, little detail is that what happens when you put the block uh, into the form of type in the press and you run off the proof, if the impression isn't really good enough, uh, you loosen the, the form, you take the block out, and it's packed up and padded uh, with material on the back of the block. And in going through a lot of these, I'm discovering, I mean, being a lover of ephemera um, and a card carrying member of the ephemera society, um, <laughs> there's some really quite interesting things. I, I rather like this sort of fragment of a menu here um, from some um, you know, Welsh rarebit sixpence and so on, but you, you find all kinds of things on the back. And also, uh, top left, or you'll see there, that there were specialist uh, firm block, block makers, because obviously <laughs> these have to be um, type high, very level plane surfaces, an extremely skillful um, a craft, really, uh, behind all these thousands of blocks that were used for illustration 
in journals and books, 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. Uh, now, um, what I want to talk about now in the next section is some of the artists and engravers whose work was reproduced in the early issues of Arch Cam. Uh, and I want to begin with a rather tragic figure, really, of John Thomas Blight. Um, born in 1835, son of a teacher, brought up in Penzance, and early on developed an interest in the antiquities of Cornwall, especially around Land's End. Mm. He was clearly a natural artist, and he learned, we don't know how, uh, the craft of wood engraving. And by the age of 20, he had published a profusely illustrated book on the antiquities at the Penwith district. Mm -hmm. He was taken up by the eccentric uh, uh, R.S. Hawker, the vicar of Morwenstow. Um, some of you may know about him. Um, extremely eccentric. Apparently in his youth, he used to uh, uh, go and sit on rocks and low tide and um, drape seaweed about himself and pretend to be a mermaid. <laughs> but latterly, uh, he took up rescuing um, shipwrecked sailors off uh, the North Cornish coast. So a, a strange and difficult character. But anyway, he took up the young, uh, the young blight. And later, the Shakespearean scholar, James Halliwell, also sort of took him up there and he did a, Blight did a vast number of, of drawings for Halliwell. But the problem was he was never properly paid for any of this work and he struggled to support himself. Um, for example, he was held in quite high regard in antiquarian circles, but he couldn't afford even to go up to London to be admitted after his election for a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries until Halliwell gave him some money you know, just to make the trip up to London. Now, less well known, and I did set out earlier on, there's a short biography of uh, Blight done by people in Cornwall, the fact that he undertook commissions for the Cambrians, actually visited sites with leading uh, members, made drawings and plans, and then engravings. And I think, um, for what I can see from the accounts that are printed at the end of the Cambrians volumes, I think uh, he was at least properly paid by our association uh, for his work. Well, I, I, I like to think that. I, I must research that if possible a bit further. But we, you know, as with many of these people, I mean, the massive output, the, the, the work levels is, is stupendous. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they could produce several drawings a day. You know, they're, they're working at high speed, really. Uh, and um, so overwork, and then the strain, I think, of mixing in leisured circles of antiquaries who appreciate his work without any doubt, but with, uh, with private incomes. And he did not have the income to sustain that way, way of life. It appears that he tragically had a, a massive nervous breakdown in the mid 1860s. And after a year uh, was, was placed in the Bodmin Mental Asylum and he was incarcerated there for the rest of his life. He didn't, he didn't die till, till 1911. Um, you know, a tragic, haunted figure, I, I think, really. But here's some examples of some of his early work, his Cornish work, and some of the illustrations in, in Arch Camp. And he did publish um, a few short papers. Uh, there's one on St. Pino's chest, and also on some megalithic monuments. And I think these are absolutely superb uh, woodcuts. They really, they really are. Now, uh, no such problems of income, in fact, um, beset Orlando Jewett, a renowned architectural draftsman and engraver, who wealthy Cambrian authors sometimes employed to illustrate their articles. Because as we've heard, uh, we heard from Hugh last night, I mean, Bongo Jones, probably less, probably John Williams, because, but did, did use quite a bit of their own money uh, in the production of the journal. But it was thought, it was expected really of authors and patrons that they cough up um, for the very considerable costs actually of printing the journal. I mean, you look at the accounts at the back of some of the early issues of Arch Cam, and uh, well, the print, the cost of illustrations is not, actually as much as the costs of printing, but it's pretty close. Um, very considerable sums of money uh, were involved. Uh, so, you know, wealthy Cambrians, they, they were expected to generously pay uh, for the illustrations for their own, their own papers. 
Jewett, Orlando Jewett came from a family of Sheffield cutlers. Uh, so many of these families early engravers, they, they, they're often skilled in engraving on metalwork, you know, um, sort of uh, uh, plate and such things like that. And they move into, into wood engraving. And he was one of 17 children. His father, Arthur Jewett, a schoolmaster, writer of local histories and guides. And Orlando learned the engraving techniques and he steadily improved his techniques um, and, and he got ever more commissions. And one of the most important was from the very influential Matthew Holbeach Bloxham, who was a Cambrian. Um, uh, and Jewett illustrated his very popular, the principles of Gothic architecture elucidated by question and answer, published in 18, 1829. And this shaped Jewett's career as the go-to engraver, really, for many works on Gothic architecture. He was taken up by Joseph Parker, 1832, who became superintendent of the Clarendon Press at Oxford. He did the engravings, a second handbook by, by Bloxham. Um, his biography, it states, his, his reputation as a careful draftsman and accomplished engraver mounted amongst lovers of the Gothic. And he had payments made to him to travel to sites to make his initial drawings, many, many church engravings. And in his final decade, he had a lot of work. Uh, he was commissioned by Gilbert Scott, Gilbert Scott. Um, and it's from this visit and in preparation for John Murray's Handbook to the Cathedrals of England, six volumes published between 1861 and 1869, that we have this um, first it's his drawing and then his engraving of St. David's uh, Cathedral, which you'll see illustrated in, uh, in Wynne Evans' article, uh, essay in, 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 in the book. And he contributed to many journals. Um, he was obviously a prodigious worker, built up a thriving business. Um, and it seems that he never, he never turned any work away. But uh, his biographer, Harry Parker, concludes that, uh, and I quote, there is no escaping the disagreeable conclusion that Orlando made a nameless drudge of his brother. How many other engravers' signatures covered similar associations in that age when so much artistic work was drudgery, one does not know. So we've heard earlier, you know, the successful were kind of family, family businesses and they were able to achieve this rate of production by sharing out sharing out the work so what is perhaps you know attributed to an engraver might have been the work of a, a small tight family workshop in, in in many instances but when we come on to um my hero <laughs> worthington george smith we're into a, a different a different uh, situation altogether because of his long association with the Cambrians, I mean, he, he uh, had a lot of other work as well. Um, but, you know, they paid, uh, they paid handsomely really for his, for his work. And when he traveled to sites, he, he regularly got about five guineas a year to attend the summer meetings. Um, I mean, I don't think he sort of, made a fortune out of all of this but you know he he was his expenses and things were were, were covered now i'm going to find my um, notes here and i'm not going to go on a great deal about uh, about wgs because um he uh, I, I i've covered uh, a lot about him in in, an article, in, in the essay in, in, in the booklet but just to say that um his experience as an engraver comes through in some of the articles that he he wrote, uh, in particular this one on the on the Tawin slate. And it's extremely interesting to read this because uh, I suppose these days he'd be said to be one of the unfashionable proponents of, uh, well, what's it called? The, the careless shepherd school of, uh, of rock art, you know, where um, these are sort of, idle doodlings really by um and, and they're not necessarily carrying a great deal of sim, uh, symbolic or shamanic movement it's not a, a theory at the moment in particular favor uh, but you know 
it's the voice of experience, the practical experience here, looking, as Francis has said, you know, looking very carefully at the object. I mean, that top quote, I not only examined it in various lights, but photographed it, because he used photographs to aid his work as a matter of course, drew it, engraved it, and following with my graver, every line originally scrapped by the ancient artist on slate. And he, he, he kind of drew these, uh, these conclusions. So I think in Worthington George Smith, we've not only got somebody who, whose work was remarkable really through his long association with, with the Cambrians. And I mean, the variety of styles and things there, but, but you know, somebody who could comment because he looked and drew, engraved, photographed, you know, um, very carefully at whatever was 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 put was put before him. <clears throat> so here's uh, again the the woodcut is here. One I think of one of his masterworks really. It's one of three. I haven't yet located the other two. They're somewhere in boxes <laughs> stored in my my hands. But it's remarkable in this Daniel head how he's managed by a, a variation, very fine variations in this white line process that Nancy talked about this morning to highlight, you know, above the above the uh, eye. Um, yes, the the cross lines are mechanical to an extent, but it's how they're modified by cuts made across them or slight variations in the line itself that he achieves these absolutely uh, remarkable, remarkable effects. Um, The other thing which I think needs a bit more research is this uh, process which called stereotyping. And there are some examples that are at the back there because wood, the wood butt cuts, the, the blocks, they're, they're remarkably durable. And even on the uh, steam presses and things, they could stand up to many impressions. But all the same, um, you know, when you come to the newspapers as so where impressions you know, running into thousands, um, they, you know, they they really couldn't uh, stand up to that level of uh, of wear. So quite early on, you get this process whereby um, the woodcut itself, um, uh, a sort of mould, is made of it, um, and that then is cast in, 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 uh, copper generally into that mold and that is mounted on tight metal and you'll see quite a few examples of that at the back. Now I'm puzzled by this because I can understand why this should be done where you're going to have a, um, a newspaper say or a book that's going to run through many editions and you know produced in vast numbers. We don't really know um, you know, how many fascicules, what the print runs really were of the arch cabin. I'm not quite sure how we will ever know about that. Um, although I hope to kind of research a bit onto the publishing houses that uh, were used. So I can't quite understand why this process should be used for possibly things which are only going to have hundreds of impressions. And I can only think this is because the publishers who are publishing the ones that were chosen to publish uh, uh, is, uh, um, issues of ArchCam, uh, were using um, state-of-the-art uh, steam presses that really needed to have, you know, this much more resistant uh, image for the for the presses to be used. But that's at the moment just uh, just theory. Steel engravings. Then, well, this is something again which is very much a, comes into the fore in the 19th century, because in the 18th century, um, you know, it's copper plate really for maps and things like that, which can be re-engraved, uh, but does wear. Um, and so, you know, you'll find, well, you know, with say maps that we all know about mordens and, you know, that they, they, you know, the later impressions, they get, they get very, very worn. Technique of engraving on steel rather than copper, um, it was an American invention brought to Britain in the early 19th century um, and it was used especially at first and indeed through the century uh, for engraving for banknotes um, but became widely used uh, in book and journal illustration and the you've seen 
these early frontispieces, our first illustration, our first frontispiece, Nachkamp, is a steel engraving. And there are a couple of steel engravings out there. And the person, uh, the, 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 well, the firm, I think we might well practice, let's use that word, um, that was universally used was that run by John de Kerr, um, himself uh, son of an engraver, um, he served an apprenticeship with a leading engraver in, in, in Scotland, James Bassier, and he built up a formidable reputation as an architectural draftsman and uh, engraver, um, exhibited architectural drawings at the Royal Academy in the early 19, 1860s, and then he moved to Durham and built up a very successful practice illustrating books such as uh, Memorials of Cambridge and so on. Now, he controlled the printing of these uh, engravings, um, and there are one or two interesting reports in the AGMs in Archcam that uh, uh, they sort of, we must, we must get um, Monsieur, Monsieur Lecour to, to let us have um, the original steel engravings that we have paid for <laughs> that are still in his possession, uh, because I think he, he did hang on to them. Uh, but there are a few uh, in, in the collection there. So it's, it was much harder than copper, could take many impressions. But in fact, as a process, it's not just engraving, it's also a, a kind of etching process as, as well. Uh, in fact, often some of the detail is, is etched onto the plate and then the final detail is by hand burin engraving. Um, I won't go into the technical technical details of, of, of that. But that's in a way the second with the woodcuts and then the steel engravings. They are predominantly what we see in the arch cams, 1840s, 1850s, uh, 1860s. And it's quite interesting to look at the 1889, uh, the 1890 volume, just to see how things are progressing. The Cambrian's visit to Brittany, and we've got a lovely paper in the book by Mary Therese about uh, Cambrian's visits and the different techniques that are being used. They took Worthington George Smith with them. It would seem that it's the first and only time he ever went abroad, but they paid for him to go. Um, and he certainly worked pretty hard out there because there are many, many lovely uh, drawings and blocks. Now this one at Karnak, this must have been produced using this camera lucida that uh, Nancy mentioned this morning, which is basically a, a simple thing really, two uh, angled prisms. So, you know, it reflects uh, the, what you see in front of you, say if I was taking a photograph, it would reflect that onto the surface on which you're doing the drawing. And it must have been that device that lays behind his being able to produce uh, illustrations uh, like this, which, um, again, I'd like to have the opportunity to check on this accuracy, but uh, uh, from, you know, what illustrations I've seen from similar perspectives it is extraordinarily accurate but by 1890 um, we're also getting some photographs photo lithographs uh, and as I say Cam many of the early Cambrians they were very keen photographers uh, and they took the cameras with them this one on the left there is from um, is Thomas um, Mansell Franklin, a prominent Cambrian and uh, a very keen photographer, along with both R.W. and W.H. Banks. And then on the right, again mentioned, I think by Francis, you know, the, the work Sir Henry Dryden and Lucas, this, um, this section really uh, shown here. Now, this was reproduced again by this newer process of photo lithography. And I think the Cambrians are fortunate, what job? WGS was quite fortunate in a way that his son, um, uh, uh, Arthur, I think it's Edmund Smith, um, was an accomplished photographer as well and developed this newer methods of photo lithography, but also this process of actually printing the photograph onto the block, which could then be much more easily engraved because the photograph you know, could be, um, you didn't have to go through any of the reduction processes, you just make sure you printed it uh, <laughs> to fit the size that you wanted for the illustration. So we've got these different processes being used in this, uh, it's a remarkable, a remarkable report. Mm -hmm. 
Now, <laughs> color, color illustration um, <laughs> could be and was done quite frequently in the 19th century, but uh, was an expensive process. If produced by lithographs, it would be hand colored. And we're all familiar with some of these superb big folio volumes in libraries, you know, uh, libraries of the wealthy and so on. Um, but this was way beyond uh, what could be afforded in journals. And yet this process of chromolithography, and essentially what you had to do really was um, have more than one impression of the stone, um, with different colored inks to build up this composite image. It's quite a complicated process, but the results can be superb. And we do have one fantastic example in Archcam of the, of the Kai Gawley Bowl, which uh, I think I've got out uh, at the, the back there. And yes, it's not perhaps like a modern photograph, but to me, when you see the original, it actually, you know, the gold is sort of almost burnished on, on, on the page. So just occasionally they splashed out and, uh, you know, paid for this expensive illustrative method because this these whole lithographic processes, this is the third main method of printing. I mean, we've heard about relief, these relief rope work, intaglio where you engrave and the line gets, uh, the, the, the engraved line holds the ink and the planographic process uh, where well, you don't engrave at all, uh, but the image is taken from the stone by um, alternate properties of water repellent areas and, and, and crayons, greased crayons and so on. I won't, I won't go into the detail. That's the third, the third main process and still, and still practiced uh, uh, by, by artists today. So the very first photograph, which appears in Archcam in 1886, is produced by this photolithographic process. Um, so the problem was, I mean, they're using photographs, they're taking photographs, uh, but right from the beginning, the problem was how to print photographs in sufficient quantities to include in books and journals. And right from the beginning, people like uh, Fox Talbot are experimenting with all kinds of methods to do this. Photolithography works quite well. In fact, it works very well because, you know, you've got the reproduction of the tonal images, but it was quite expensive um, and difficult to do in, in, high, in high volume. But if you look in some of the illustrations, the 1880s and 1890s, I think you see some very fine examples of how this is done. So, you know, the photograph is used in different ways to produce the, the, the printed, the, an image that can be, that can be printed. Um, so this on the right has actually, <laughs> is actually a, a, a photographic impression on a block that could then, a metal block that could be there, that then be printed. But that was the, that was the um, well, decades really of experimentation. And success really doesn't come until the 1880s, 1890s, when you get this half tone process. And this is the way in which you transfer the essential quality of a photograph, which is a kind of tonal image, whereas the wood blocks, the steel engravings, these are line images really how to transfer that onto the printed page and do this in vast quantities. And this is how it's achieved really, and that the photograph is printed through a screen, fine dots. Um, and obviously the higher quality images, the, fi the finer the screen. And then, and only then really, can you start, you see in, 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 in printing, this is from 1880s, 1890s, photographic images really become, become the norm. Uh, uh, they're everywhere. Um, and I'm ending here now with this uh, extraordinary image from um, Cambrian photographers when they went out to Skellig Michael. Um, they were able to uh, secure uh, through contacts um, a transport through one of Her Majesty's, uh, the, Her Majesty's vessels, the gunboat HM Banterer. Um, was was uh, came into the harbour to take them. There was a big 
well, I suspect rather an ugly scene actually at the at the harbour there because the ladies were supposed to accompany this um, expedition, um, but it was said that you know it, it could be a bit too dangerous and nasty, and they they were left behind. And apparently, they were not best pleased. So they get out Skellig Michael, and the, and I dare say there are some of you here. I mean, I have many years ago. Some of you will have been to Skellig Michael. Um, not exactly easy to get to and certainly not easy to land on. And the idea, really, the image of these, you know, assiduous Cambrians kind of scrambling off HM, just his gunboat banterer, sort of clambering up the rough steps um, with all this heavy gear <laughs> to take these photographs is really quite a, quite a remarkable one. Um, and I would think that uh, what we heard this morning from um, from Ian is that uh, that's uh, it was good to know that that tradition of um, absolute <laughs> dedication to getting the right shot uh, continued well into our own time with those splendid photographs that he showed us that uh, you know must be among the highlights really of some of the archive of uh, uh, of uh, the Royal Commission and many of course you know reproduced in the pages of Archcam. So that's where I'll finish with something of a, a broad brush overview, but uh, lots more work, lots more research to be done. All quite fascinating, I think. Thank you very much.